This is House Planning Help, episode 36. Hello, I'm Ben Adam Smith, and this is the podcast for you. If you're interested in building a house or perhaps renovating one, what exactly should we be doing? I'm exploring the best practices by speaking to people who've been there and done it. It's also my personal goal to create an energy efficient home by August 2016. Today we're looking at water and why we should be saving it. My guest is Kath Hassel from ECH2O Consultants. But first, I wanted to reflect on quite a significant event. I keep saying that I'm more interested in action and what we can do in our own lives than worrying about the larger impact of climate change. That said, this is a really major event. A week or so back, Typhoon Haiyan struck the Philippines, and it's thought to have been the strongest storm ever to have made landfall. The death toll was into the thousands. And you just look at an event like this, even if it was nothing to do with man-made climate change, it is climate change and it is having an impact there. I was lucky enough to travel around the Philippines a few years ago. It was 2006. But even in the short time that I spent there of two months, we experienced a typhoon. So they do get this typhoon season. But it really made me think about how sustainable is it to be in these areas, particularly on the east coast of the Philippines, because that's where all the typhoons seem to come in. It it affects the same towns or a range of them, depending on where exactly. But the one that we went to that had been hit badly was called Legaspi. And I don't think we even realised this. We wouldn't have gone there and caused them extra trouble if we'd known that it was a lot of it just under mud, the houses were and they were still digging them out and then all the power cables were down and a lot of the houses had been destroyed. There were some that were untouched, but as I say, that was just a minor one. But on this situation of the bigger issue, do they consider relocation at some point? Does that become uninhabitable or do we have to get better at thinking, well, if we're going to put houses here, they need to be able to withstand a serious amount of weather impacting on it. I'm just throwing it out there. I have no idea what the answers are, but I thought this was, again, a significant point that's worth mentioning in this podcast. We've all got to do what we can in our own lives. I don't see how we can make a a bigger impact, except I'm going to put into the show notes for this episode a link so that you can donate to the Philippines and the rebuilding that will be going ahead there. I'm sure you've probably done it already, but just in case, houseplanninghelp.com forward slash 36. See, I feel funny about mentioning these sorts of things. But in one respect, I'm saying, no, I've got to do it because this is relevant. And in the other, should I be doing it? Because what what can we do? How can we get active? I'd, I'd much rather we're doing things than just looking and saying, oh, goodness, that's bad what's happening out there. Let's get to our interview for today. And we're looking at water. I always try to keep these interviews on a broad perspective, I say to the interviewees beforehand, if there's any way we can try and broaden this out so it's relevant to the world, that would be great. But sometimes it just happens that you can't even answer the questions unless you pick an area. So we do get more focused on the UK as we go on. Kath Hassel is from ECH2O Consultants, and I would describe her as a character. I hope she doesn't mind me saying that. I just, each time I meet her, I love her more and more. I think she's brilliant. But she's not only extremely knowledgeable about water, but you can hear it is also her passion. So my first question was how she became interested in this area. Well, I was a plumber on site for a lot of years fell into plumbing completely by chance but once I started doing plumbing I was just like whoa this is so interesting and then I just got really really into it and when I was first on site I loved UPVC pipe that is the best pipe to use for waste pipe which environmentally is really really bad uh we used to put in dual flush toilets and this was back in the 80s and um We'd never put the little sign up and then we'd have discussions in pubs about, oh, yeah, well, what's the point of putting the sign on how to use it? And nobody, everybody rips the sign off. Then a friend of mine, she went up to CAT, Central Alternative Technology, and she sent me back a book about compost toilets. And um, she said, oh, Cathy, you'd love this place and you'd love the compost toilets. And I was thinking, oh, what's Teresa going on about, like compost toilets? So it's going to be like pit latrines. And I read the book and I was like, oh, OK, this is really interesting. Nothing like pit latrines. And then... I just got really, really interested at that point, from that point onwards in all the different environmental aspects of plumbing. And what's great about being a plumber is it's it is about water, but it's also about all the heating systems. So solar thermal as well. It's 
and never look back really yeah where exactly do we start with water what is the first thing that we need to have in our mind and to know about Mm, okay it's an interesting question oh (laughs) where do we start okay i mean i think there were there were three types of water you need to think about the water that comes into a building the water that goes out of a building and the water that falls onto the building, which is basically rainwater that falls onto the building. So all of those types of water need to be addressed, how we use them, what we do with them after it's been used, how we clean them, etc. And then with the rainwater that falls onto our building, do we collect that, store it, use it? Do we try to get rid of it in a different way to what we currently do in the West, which is pretty much just stick it into a drain and get rid of it, which causes such a lot of problems downstream. So I think it's difficult to say where do you start, but with uh, we do, or I do a lot of work in schools, and in schools I always start with, well, how do you use water? So where's the main things? Flushing the loo, washing, so showering and bathing, and kind of that's where I start. And are we thinking about efficiency when we talk about those things why are we interested in water because i must admit up until this point that it it became relevant i didn't really think of water as something that's important in a place like the uk where we tend to get a fair amount of rainfall not everywhere but we have done okay so there's different aspects aren't there if we look at water in a global perspective it's it's kind of really different some people really don't have enough water obviously some people have to walk miles to find water a lot of people don't have tapped piped water to their buildings a lot of people don't have adequate sanitation so two of the millennium goals were about getting adequate sanitation to everybody in the world and safe water supplies to everybody in in the world so you could start from that very very basic position like so many people in the world don't have a toilet even practice open defecation so many people don't have safe water supplies but once you move into the west once you look at start to look at how do we use water efficiently then it's important for for different reasons you said we have plenty of water in in the uk because it's always raining interestingly in the uk we have a lot of grey days with a lot of drizzle. So in fact, we don't, in some areas of the UK, we have less water per head than countries which you would think are very, very hot countries. So for example, we have less water in the South East or London. People in London have less water available per head than people living in Spain, for example. And you sort of think, oh, how does that work? Because Spain is always really hot when we go to Spain. Here it's not hot. So it's a function of how much water falls, it's a function of can you store that water, is it stored underground, is it stored in reservoirs, but then even once you've got access to that water, that water has to be cleaned, it has to be then pumped into our buildings, once we've used it, it has to be taken away and cleaned again before it can be put back into the environment, so all of that takes energy, and that's before you even start to think about heating that water. And as soon as you start to heat it, most of the time to heat it, we're using fossil fuels. That's producing CO2 emissions. Once you've got CO2 emissions, then it becomes a a global issue. But within the UK, you know, in effect, within the UK, our water use, if it's just cold water, is very much just a UK issue. We're not a country, although obviously we have four separate countries within the UK, but we're not a country that shares a river basin. There isn't the potential for us to go to war with other people over water, which, you know, for example, let's just talk about the River Nile. The River Nile, I think something like seven countries take their water from the Nile. Seven countries rely on the water from the Nile, but it's only Sudan and Egypt that actually have any rights written rights to water from the Nile Sudan's recently split into north southern Sudan and Sudan so that's caused more tension Um, and you need water we all need water to live but we need water to grow crops as well as obviously keeping clean etc we also need well we use lots of water in industry we use lots of water in mining it's actually a huge 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 issue and In some ways, I would love to chat about that and we can certainly chat for hours about that. But in some ways, maybe we we kind of need to narrow it down a bit and start to look at it in terms of buildings within within the UK. Otherwise, I think every question that you ask me, there will be so many answers to it. It would be hard for me to sort of give you an answer. 
that's fair enough. Maybe I can just ask you one more general question, which if it has a million answers, just tell me and we'll, <laughs> okay. we'll move on. But is water always stored in the same way around the world? Or is this a situation of certain people just drawing from a river or from okay. deep in the ground? No. So basically your catchment areas are rivers. So originally settlements grew up around around rivers before there was that ability to then move water around. But a lot of water is also stored in rocks, so underground aquifers. Some of those aquifers are quite shallow aquifers, so hand-built or hand-dug wells, you're able to access water. Others are very, very deep, so haven't been accessible until sort of modern machinery has, has enabled us to drill down through rock and to pump water up from hundreds of metres deep. So, so no, it's, it's found in different areas. The, the thing about aquifers, in, in effect, aquifers are like... Sometimes we talk about mining for fossilised water because there are aquifers around that were filled with water many millennia of years ago. Sorry, what is an aquifer? OK, so an aquifer is an underground reservoir of water and usually an aquifer is just the rock... The rock is permeable, and so the rock holds water within it, but it can actually be a body of water underground, but usually it's water held within within the rock. And so you can access that water by drilling down. Now, some aquifers, when it rains, an aquifer will get recharged. So most of the aquifers that we use within the UK, when it rains, that aquifer or that groundwater gets recharged, and it does that on a, on a yearly cycle. But there are some areas in the world where there is water. For example, under the Sahara Desert, there is thousands of cubic metres or thousands of cubic kilometres of water. Fossilised water, water that fell there before the Sahara Desert was a desert. Many, many, many metres deep. But there is water under the Sahara Desert. But that would be classified as fossilised water because that will not be recharged again if, if, if we accessed it, if we went there with huge, great big drills and pumped it all out and started to grow things in the Sahara Desert, we could do it for a while, then it would just all disappear. Um, so it's about, with everything, really using a resource that's, that's there, that's sustainable, so using it sustainably. So if it gets renewed every year because there's enough rain, then that's great, then we're using it in a sustainable way, and that's really how we should be using water. Groundwater is usually better than river water. It generally tends to be cleaner because it's filtered as it's, as we, it's gone through the ground. Um, it's cooler and it hasn't run away to sea. We've stored it, whereas rivers, it rains, it falls into the rivers, the rivers run to the sea and in effect we've lost it. I mean, I know we get the cycle, we get the water cycle, then we get then it condensation forms, we get clouds, it rains again. But it's, rivers are not seen as stores of water which is why we have reservoirs. So we say, OK, we've got this river running along here, but we want to store that water, so we take that water out and put it in a reservoir. The Western world, mm. then, the approach that we would have, we just turn on a tap, mm. we've got clean water. Mm. How efficient is that? Is that a good way of doing it because we're all here together? For example, we're in London at the moment. Is that the best way to tackle it because it's all being cleaned or should we be doing more in the house? OK, well, I think from a health and sanitation point of view, the fact that we actually have pipe water running to, into our buildings is very, very important. There's no way that we should go back to, to not having that. that. That is fundamentally important to our health and prosperity, really, as a nation, but really to, to health. The other fact is, is that that water that comes into our houses... It's cleaned. It has to be cleaned. It has to be cleaned to what we call potable water or drinkable water quality. We're only going to be drinking 1% of it. Uh, we might be cooking with another 1%, maybe 3% of it, but it all has to be to that standard. So it's about sort of recognising that and saying, yeah, you know, look, we're really, really lucky to have this access to water. We don't have to walk miles to get our water or we don't have to buy our water from tankers, not, you know, not in the UK not in most of the Western world. We do have piped water. That's a privilege, really, not a right that we've got. But what we need to recognise is that we need to use that water sensibly. We need to use that water. We need to understand that there is a cost to that water, both environmentally because of the 
of the energy to get it into our buildings. Um, once we've used it, we've got to clean it, as I said before, that's more energy. It has to be, goes through our sewers, goes through the sewage treatment plant. The water's there, but we can't just use as, as much as we want. We just, we need to understand that, you know, it's there for all of us. But if everyone just goes, well, I just want to use 500 litres per day because that's my right as a citizen. Actually, that's not your right. You know, in, in effect, it's part of the commons. You know, it's part of the global commons or it's part of the national commons. We all have, we all have a responsibility to use it as, as sensibly as we can. Is this about us and our lifestyle or are there systems that we should be building into our house to make sure that we use the minimum amount of water possible? All right. So I think that it's a combination of both technological solutions and behaviour change solutions. Just technological solutions won't work and just behaviour change solutions won't work. So in terms of WC flush, WC flush back in the 1960s, the maximum flush volume you were allowed was... 15 litres. Before that, it, there, were, there sort of wasn't a maximum flush volume, so you could be flushing with 20 litres. It was 15 litres, then it was reduced to 9 litres, then it was reduced to 7.5 litres. Then in 2001, to 1999, 2000, it was reduced to 6 litres maximum flush volume. Now, there are lots of toilets around that have also dual flush, so you can use 6 and 4 litre dual flush or even 4 to 2.5 litre dual flush. Most of the time we only have a wee. We don't actually need 6 litres to just flush away wee, so therefore we can use 4 litres or in very modern toilets, or very, not very modern because of 6 and 4 are very modern, but you can use as little as 2.5. Our toilet here in our house, we use 2.4 litres when we just had a wee. So there is this sort of, if it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down. Now, I've been, I was a plumber for many years. I have seen the effect in London, in hard water areas, if you don't flush the loo, the scale buildup that you get, because there's scale in urine. So if you don't flush the loo and you let it hang around for too long, you start to get scale. Then what people do is, oh, the toilet looks really disgusting because it's full of scale. So then they put a whole pile of disinfectant down and scale remover. And then environmentally, that's actually really bad. So my advice is always, if you've had a wee, flush the loo. Yeah, sure, if you've had a wee and someone's going to have a wee straight away afterwards, maybe. But don't just go, well, I'm not going to flush the loo until someone has a poo because you will then just get these huge issues of, of scale build up. And then, like I say, you'll start to use chemicals. So, you see, it's important that we save water. Absolutely fundamentally, it's important that we, that we save water. But actually, it's more important that we save hot water than we save cold water. In, in effect, when you're saving hot water, it's a win-win situation. The carbon footprint of cold water in the UK has been worked out at... 1.2 kilowatt hours of electrical energy, which translates into about 0.7 kilograms of CO2 for every one cubic meter of cold water that comes into our house. And then once it's been used in our house, is then taken away and cleaned. That's for the cold water. But once we start to heat that water, then its footprint increases rapidly. So now, 6% of the UK's carbon footprint comes from hot water that we use just in our homes. And this is why the government's very keen for us to reduce our use of hot water more than just water. What I'm almost saying is not all water is the same. That hot water has that extra added burden of CO2 emissions in it. And, of course, CO2 emissions become a global issue. Now, technological solutions have been around i was talking about wc flush being reduced 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 that's great what we've generally tended to do with technological solutions in terms of hot water use is almost gone the other way so it's like we've said you uk we have um what plumbers call cold water storage system in the loft what everybody else calls a tank in the loft we've always had very very poor quality showers historically in the UK with a very low flow rate. Now we have pumped showers, which are called power showers. If you have a combi boiler, you can get more powerful showers. So it's almost as though the flow rate from showers has been increasing, increasing, increasing. So technology has taken this the other way there. Instead of being more efficient, technology in terms of showers has become less efficient in terms of how much water we use. So that's where behaviour change can have a real 
effect. So still use the loo when you want it. Think about your water use. Think about how long you have a shower for. How long are you under the shower? Are you under the shower to wash and get clean? Or are you under the shower to solve the problems of the world? Are you having a bath to get clean? Or are you having a bath right to the top? just because you want to. Um, you know, if you have a full bath, that's 160 litres of water to fill your bath up and line it. The average person in the UK uses 150 litres of water a day. So if you're having a deep bath every day, you're using more than the average, that's just in the bath. If you have a shower, it depends on the flow rate from your shower, but if you have a five-minute shower, that's great. You'll use between 35 to even if you had a power shower you'll be used between 35 to 100 litres of water but if you have a 10 minute shower a 15 minute shower 20 minute shower and you also have a power shower if you're having a 20 minute shower and a power shower you're using 400 litres of water and most of us have a shower every day so that's almost three times as much as the average just in a shower so it's about short showers shallow air baths is what I say and that's really just think about water all the time and once you start thinking about water it becomes much harder to go yeah do you know what I'm just going to stay in this shower for 20 minutes you start to think oh hold on a minute <laughs> okay no perhaps I should have have less yeah is one of the problems that water is too cheap? I never like saying this because I know a lot of people, it's very expensive, but theoretically for a working person, they perhaps think, well, I can just have whatever shower I like, I can have whatever bath I like. See, I would never, I would never ever use the argument really for anything that something is too cheap. Still, only 40% of us in houses in the UK are actually paying for our water for the amount of water that we use. 60% of us are still paying on what's called the rateable value. So we pay a flat rate. But that is changing. There is a sort of a, a universal metering programme happening in the southeast of England. So more and more people are, are having to pay for water per volumetric for how much water they use. I think what would be much, much fairer is to say, OK, so, you know, the average use is 150 litres of water per day. We would like to get that down to the government did used to have a figure of 130 litres. They've just dropped that figure as a target, but they had a figure of 130 litres. So let's say that we say at a real base rate, you could have 130 litres of water per day and you can pay for that at a base rate. But if you want to use more water than that, obviously you can, but that will cost you a lot more. If you have a medical condition that means you have to use more water, then that has to be taken into account. But if you just want to use more water because you want to stand under your shower for half an hour, singing, whatever, you can do that. But you should pay a premium to do that. If you want to use loads of water in the garden because of the you want to keep your garden looking really nice and the sort of planting scheme that you've got, that's fine. But you should pay more. To me, that would be much fairer. But it's also interesting, this thing of you saying that water in the UK is too cheap or is it cheap? The cost of water in the UK varies depending on what area you're in. So currently... If you live in the Thames Water area, so that's London and sort of across from London to up to Oxford, Reading, their area, you're paying just under £2 for a cubic metre of water. If you live down in the southwest in Cornwall and Devon, you're paying £5.50 for a cubic metre of water. It's a massive, massive difference. So for people down in the, in the southwest to turn around and say to them, oh, well, the, your water's too cheap. Their water is already over two and a half times as much as we're paying in other areas. of. Nothing's ever simple, is yeah, it? <laughs> it was just an idea. <laughs> OK, let's have a think about wa rainwater. But, but ben, can I just say, you say nothing's ever simple, but actually implementing that everybody gets 130 litres per person per day at a real base rate... I think is simple. I think it's not going to backfire. <laughs> what, what's not going? <laughs> well, I don't know. I'd sometimes you, we, we've seen this before, haven't we? We, we both know in, in certain systems, um, the code for sustainable homes in the UK uh, uh, has, has been a tick box. But this one, there wouldn't be any side effect. That's all I would say. No, 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 not at all. I mean, in our house, I've already said about the four and two and a half litres. 
We have flow regulation on all our taps. We sorry, have what, what does that mean? So oh, you're sorry, just limiting okay, flow it? regulation. Yeah, we have not really limiting, but we set the flow rate, the rate at which the water comes out of our taps. We set that using a bit of technological kit, something called a flow regulator. But you wouldn't turn on any of our taps and think there's not a lot of water. You wouldn't get in our shower and think, oh, there's not a lot of water from any of them. And I can guarantee that. We could go afterwards and I'll stick you under the shower bed and you can <laughs> try it out. But because we have, A, a very efficient toilet and also because we think about how long we're in the shower, I basically am in the shower maximum two minutes. I do the stop-start shower method of showering which is you get in you get wet then you turn the water off and then you do all the soaping up and shampoo and then you turn it on just to rinse off again I am actually under running water for less than two minutes my partner she's under running water for less than four minutes but we use water in the garden we use grey water in the garden which we can probably talk about later possibly but we still sometimes have to use tap water mains water in the garden and yet our average is 70 litres per person per day which is less than half of the national average and we're not dirty we're very clean you know we shower every day so 130 litres you won't backfire on that that's kind of just what I wanted to say there. Okay, looking at rainwater harvesting Mm. then, because this was one of the questions that was brought up recently. Is it a good idea to incorporate in a house? What should we be thinking about when we consider Mm. rainwater harvesting? Okay, so I, I think that what we want to do is we want to keep rainwater out of the stormwater stream. One of the very first things I said right at the beginning were the three types of water water comes into the building the foul water that goes out and the water that falls on our building which is the rainwater and we can do different things with that there is a sort of quite a movement and certainly that was driven a lot by the code that was saying okay well we need to collect that rainwater and we'll use it in the buildings to flush toilets and for washing machines and you can do that that works the technology is out there to make that work but what would actually be better and much simpler to my mind is that We collect rainwater and use it on the garden, for those of us who've got gardens, and we need the water on the garden. But we keep rainwater out of the stormwater stream. So instead of just going, oh, my God, here it is, here comes the rain, quick, get it into into a drain, get it into the sewer, get rid of it, that actually what we do is we keep it in the area. So there's something called rain gardens, which are a new thing. They're not a new thing. They're a new thing to the UK. It's about just saying, OK, well, we're not going to put the rain straight away into the sewers. We're going to put it onto a planter or we're going to run it into an area in the garden where there are plants. Sometimes those plants will end up being inundated with water if it's rained really hard. But we allow it to just soak away into the ground and we keep rainwater out of the stormwater stream. Because one of the big issues that we have in the UK, especially in our cities, is that our drains are combined drains. So we have both foul water, sewage going into those drains, and we have rainwater. And we have what's called dry weather flow when it's not raining. And I can't think what they call it, dry weather flow when it's not raining, and then the flow when it's raining. I don't know if it's called wet weather flow. So our sewage treatment plants can cope with dry weather flow. But when it rains, what happens is there's too much water for the sewage treatment plants to cope with. And so that water which is a mix of both rainwater and foul water and by foul water it's all the used water from the house so used water from the toilet used water from the kitchen sink used water from the shower used water from the bath etc that then runs out of something called combined sewer overflows and it runs into rivers or it runs out into the sea and that's the big problem that we have and If we just took rainwater out of that and just kept rainwater by our buildings instead of putting it into the sewers, then we would only have dry weather flow in the sewers and our sewage treatment plants would always be able to clean the water. If we've got water in a tank somewhere, there's no side effect of it not actually being back in the the system. Because if everyone put water into a tank, isn't that actually quite bad for the environment? No, I mean, I think that probably what you're asking there is an argument that I have heard that 
Well, we, we require rainwater to give the drains a, a good flushing out or the sewers a good flushing out because the sewers are designed to cope with dry weather flow. So you should go under the, into the sewers, Ben. I have been into the sewers. The sewers Maybe it's a video moment. <laughs> Well, if you do, if you do, let me come down and with you. That would be very nice. I'd love to go down again. But anyway, so, no, I mean, do you want to explain to me actually more kind of than what you mean by that question? Yeah. I may be confused, yeah. but yeah. say, for example, I've seen a, a few, um, an autonomous house, for example, that stores all its rainwater. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I know that that water will eventually just go out onto the land. But there's nothing bad in the fact that if rainwater, a lot of it is taken out of the ecosystem, even if it's just for a short amount of time, that if everyone did that, then all water would be stored. I don't know. Maybe there is nothing. No, there isn't. Well, okay. No, there isn't. I have heard the argument this that we need sometimes we need rainwater in the in the sewers because it helps to flush the sewers out but the reality is is that you get rainwater in the sewers it causes the problems i've already talked about at the combined sewer overflow when you get mixture of rain and raw sewage going out to seas or into rivers as soon as it starts raining all the sewer workers have to come back up from underground because of the issues the danger of possibly being drowned underwater it would be absolutely fine if we just all kept our water and yeah it's it's kind of frustrating because it's such a it's it's sort of almost such a non-argument and and part of me thinks well yeah I could go into like the real minute (laughs) detail of saying well in this situation it could potentially be an issue it's quite hard for me I know this is supposed to be a generalized chat but also what's quite hard is I always want to go down into the nitty gritty and into the real plumbing bits. And I do find it quite hard to stay quite general. So let me just say to you, no, it wouldn't be a problem. <laughs> leave, it at, leave it at that. Well, actually, we're getting towards the end of our time now. I can't okay. believe it. I don't think I've asked a lot of what I'd hoped to. So maybe we'll have to do another session uh, further, down the, part two. Yeah. <laughs> further down the track. <laughs> but... Is there any fundamental part of this system for for people that are coming to build their own houses or to retrofit that we haven't mentioned that is worth bringing up just as as this final part one? Okay, so what I would say is if you're looking to to retrofit or build a new one, go for the most efficient dual flush loos on the market. And like I say, there are six and four, but there are so many four and two and a half litre dual flush loos out there now. Go for a flow regulated shower. Go for a shower that comes off of directly off of the mains. So you either put in an unvented hot water cylinder or you have a combi boiler. But that means that your water is coming in at high pressure. So you've got good pressure and then you can have a shower that's flow regulated down. Ours is flow regulated down to seven and a half litres per minute. Um, The government's currently considering about whether to have maximum flow of 10 litres a minute of a shower in new build. I hope that that regulation comes in. So I would flow regulate down shower to seven and a half litres a minute. I would put flow regulation on the taps, kitchen tap to six litres a minute, wash hand basin taps to four litres a minute. I would still stay with a standard size bath because those tiny little baths, you know, if you do want to have a bath, most people want to have a bath to sort of relax in. So, you know, stay with your standard size bath. I would say if you've got a garden, collect as much rainwater as you can to use it in the garden. Look at not connecting any of your rainwater downpipes into the drains. So use that water in your garden. Like I say, you can just use it in rain gardens. You can just, when it rains, run it off into an area of the garden and just plant that area of the garden with sort of different plants than you would plant in other areas because it will need to, those plants will need to be able to cope with um, being inundated with water, having their roots sitting under water for some parts of the year. Look for permeable surfaces, or so any hard surfaces that you're building, you can look for permeable surfaces there. So you've got the permeable paving or just gravel. Don't have big areas of concrete around. Um, 
You can consider what we do here is we actually use the grey water, which is the water from our shower and our wash hand basin. We actually use that in the spring and the summer on our garden. Um, we don't bring it back into the house because there's huge issues with grey water if you bring it back into the house because it's got bits of skin in, it's got bits of soap, it's got bits of hair. It decomposes quite quickly, but if you use it out in the garden, that's a really good way to use water. And then in terms of your behaviour, I think one of the really good things is a small shower timer. All the water companies are now giving away four-minute shower timers. People don't really know how long they're in the shower. So if you ask people, oh, how long are you in the shower? I don't know, probably 10 minutes. I don't know, 10 minutes, maybe 15. If you give them a shower timer and then get them to time it, they say, oh, I was in the shower much less than I than I realised. So I think every lot, so many people think that, oh, it's going to be really difficult to use much less water. But actually it's not. And that's probably the easiest things to say and do. Well, Kath, thank you very much for some great information today. And we'll look forward to part two. (laughs) Sounds good. Thanks so much, Ben. Enjoyed it greatly. (laughs) You can find out more about Kath in today's show notes. Houseplanninghelp.com forward slash 36. There'll be a link on there to ECH2O Consultants and also Kath's blog called A Year of Showering Variously. Lots of great information on that. A question as well in the show notes. Maybe you can answer this one. How have you reduced the amount of water that you use? Also, if there are any other comments relating to this episode, that will be the place to do it. Houseplanninghelp.com forward slash 36. But this principle of saving water, particularly the hot water that I took away from this episode, just makes so much sense, doesn't it? A bit like building a smaller house. You can't go wrong with those principles. And Bizarrely, earlier in the year, I just decided one day, right, I'm going to stop having baths. It was just a decision that I thought, I'm going to see what happens. Perhaps I'll share a bath with my wife every so often if she's there and she'll accept me into the bath. But really, I can be a shower only man. So I made that decision and just was interested as to whether it would impact on my life or make me feel that I was missing out in any way. And absolutely nothing. No hasn't really affected me at all. So that's definitely got me thinking as what else? What else is there? There must be all sorts of little things that we could be doing in our lives. And that could be another blog, website, idea that we could pursue at some point when I've got more time. That would just be so interesting, wouldn't it? To see, perhaps get inspiration from other people who are doing it. But I like that idea of thinking maybe I could become a vegetarian, even though my favourite food in the whole world is bacon. Could I actually just say, I don't need meat. I can survive without that. My call to action this time round is, well, I mention iTunes a lot, but what about Stitcher? Perhaps you're someone who's listening on Stitcher and I know we could do with more more reviews on there. These services, they always tend to pay attention to reviews. So if you can leave an honest review, then the more we get, generally, the more people that will be drawn towards house planning help or whatever else you're you're listening to. So if you like a podcast that you are listening to, make sure you review it because it does help. So that a shout out for people listening via Stitcher. Next time, Jason Orm from Home Building and Renovating. He is my guest and we'll be looking at overcoming some of the challenges in order to self-build. So until then, have a good one.